Happy Friday. All right, let's do that again. Happy Friday. Happy Happy Friday. Friday. All right. I hope it's been a fantastic in service for you. Uh, we are thrilled to have uh, Dr. Campbell Green with us today uh, to talk about open educational resources. Um, we really believe that this is going to hopefully uh, increase student retention and persistence, and of course reduce student debt, which I know all of us in this room care about. But I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Debbie Durr to come down and say a few words for all of us as we close out our final day of in-service. Dr. Durr. First of all, uh, again, happy Friday. I have to tell you that um, it has been an incredibly busy week and I'm really glad tomorrow's Saturday. But with that said, uh, I am so excited to have Dr. Cable Green here. I had the opportunity to hear him speak last year at the Oregon Community College Association meeting and it was very impactful. Um, impactful from multiple levels in relationship to um, how we can work together to share our resources, but as importantly, or maybe even more importantly, how we can address the issue of textbook affordability for our students. So I wanted to make sure that everyone knew that this was a collaborative effort. Um, our uh, faculty librarians, um, other employees in the library, uh, folks from our distance learning office, um, our bookstore have been working on this issue of uh, open educational resources or this really this strategy of open educational resources over the past year. And this year really I'm hoping so much that we'll have a real focus on this. Um, we actually have in the audience a couple students, so raise your hands. Many of you know Seth, um, our uh, Associated Student Government uh, President. And this is one of their top, I say their top, but one of their top priorities for the year. And so I'm anticipating quite a bit of activity um, from the Associated Student Government on the issue of textbook affordability. The other thing I want to um, talk about is what David mentioned, and that is the theme of what we've been talking about all week, and that is student success, student persistence, student retention, completion, and what does that really mean? And how can we, as a community of learners, support that effort? Now, as a president, um, one of my jobs is to walk the talk. And one of my jobs is to make sure that you all are holding me accountable as well. So last year, um, we had the availability of uh, innovation money through the Yoshida Grant for faculty to come up with innovative practices. We went through that process and we did not award any of that innovation money. What I'm willing to do this year is that if um, we have proposals, and remember you guys, this is like the idea of 30 seconds ago. So the details will follow. But um, if there is interest in developing open educational resources, truly open educational resources with the supports we're gonna learn about today, then I'm willing to take that $10,000 to put that into the development of that. The other thing, thank you. Heather down, you go girl. Um, the other thing though is I do want to remind you that um, through the uh, faculty agreement that there is also DRDB money. And this would be a wonderful way to begin to look at um, how can we not change our curriculum but change the strategies of delivery. Um, so with that, I would like to, oh, one more thing, and otherwise Heather will be mad at me, and that is that um, after the presentation today, this one in the morning, we have three workshops throughout the day. And so those workshops are more of a deep dive into the how. This is kind of the what, and to get you excited and interested, and then after that we want to show you a little bit more about the how, and then I'll work out the how about the money stuff too. So, Dr. Cable Green, Director of Global Learning Creative Commons. 
Um, Dr. Green works with a global open education community to leverage open licensing, open educational resources, and open policies to significantly improve access to quality education and research resources so everyone in the world can attain the education they desire. Cable has 18 years of academic technology experience, online learning and open educational experience, and recently led a project to build and share a general education curriculum under an open license. He holds a PhD in educational psychology from Ohio State University. He lives in Olympia, Washington, and he rides motorcycles. <laughs> so, Dr. Green. If I knew it was going to be sunny, I would have driven my motorcycle down here. It said rain. Uh, does anybody tweet? Tweeters in the audience? That's my at C Green is where you can find me on Twitter. And I, feel free to email me as well if you want to follow up. I'm, uh, but I'll warn you, I'm about, I don't know, 1,800 emails behind right now. And so if you really want to get my attention, uh, put something on Twitter, and I see that more. Uh, so first, all of these slides, everything I show is, of course, openly licensed. If you don't know what that means, you certainly will by the end of today. Uh, so all these slides are under Creative Commons Attribution License. So before we talk about open educational resources, before we talk about uh, how this is done, who's doing what, um, I always like to start with, uh, what does the status quo look like? Uh, I always like to start, you know, what's the problem look like that we're trying to solve? So uh, this may not come as a surprise. This was recently published in The Economist, uh, but they looked at the consumer price index from 1970 up through uh, 2015, and you can see that this is the cost of, of goods, cost of homes, cars, food, uh, fuel, things like that, uh, gradually moved up at, at roughly 2 to 3% uh, CPI annually. You can see in comparison what the cost of uh, textbook costs uh, have gone up. Tuition is in between these two, but it's also a pretty steep mark. Uh, but textbook prices have gone up over 1,500% in that, that time period. Uh, at the same time, uh, this is what's happened, and these are United States numbers, uh, this is what's happened to uh, student debt on the blue line, and the median income that one can expect to derive after graduating with a bachelor's degree. Uh, these stats here and others like them are the reasons that uh, especially since 2008, you've seen a lot of headlines in popular press saying things like, you know, is higher education worth it? Is because our students in the United States are graduating with more and more debt, and when they come out, it's increasingly difficult to find, not to find jobs, because unemployment rates continue to come down, which is a good thing, but to find jobs that are quote-unquote living wages, and to be frank, jobs that can pay off the tremendous student debt that, that they have. So this is a... Um, frankly, a bit of a national crisis for the United States. Um, and this is why, I'll come back to that last slide in a minute. Uh, we're now, these numbers are outdated, we're now somewhere between 1.3 and 1.4 trillion dollars in the United States is student debt. Does anybody know what's different about student debt as opposed to other kinds of debt you might have? That's right, it doesn't go away when you declare bankruptcy, so. Um, uh, when, if you, if you, become insolvent as an adult and you need uh, to restructure your debt, uh, the lobbyists from banks that control student debt have been successful in keeping student debt out of bankruptcy court proceedings uh, so that students are you're, you're stuck with it forever. Um, so how much, uh, uh, the president talked a bit about uh, textbook affordability, we'll dive deep into that subject here and then especially in the workshops and how to solve that. But essentially, this is what you're looking at, give or take, for community colleges. Uh, it really depends on what field you're in. If you're in uh, certain STEM fields, especially uh, pre-engineering or uh, different science and technology, this number is uh, oftentimes closer to $1,400 a year. Um, and if you're in some fields, it's a bit less, but that's the average. So it's roughly $1,200 a year uh, for books and supplies. And these numbers come right from the college board. Uh, tuition fees look uh, approximately like this. 
Um, Oregon, as you know, is in a very unique position right now, given that your legislature just passed and your governor signed a bill to put in uh, last dollar money to make uh, student community college tuition free. It'd be interesting to see how that unfolds as it becomes implemented, but Oregon really um, has an opportunity to, you know, essentially have free tuition for community college students. Plus, if you have open educational resources, um, you could you could have a near uh, a near free or very very affordable college experience for students in the state. So uh, all these things together, of course, are you know increasingly uh, financial pressures on. Students, so let's dive into textbooks just a bit more. Um, if you look at the top selling 50 textbooks in college bookstores, and these also correspond directly to the highest enrolled 50 courses. So what I mean by that is Psych 101, Statistics 101, uh, courses like that. The average price of these top 50 books, and this varies from year to year, but it's about $175. Now, of course, some books are more, some are less. Uh, your bookstore was very kind in giving me a list of uh, the highest enrolled 25 courses and then looking at the prices against each of those. Uh, and they range on the low end from sometimes only $20 and on the high end up around these, these numbers as well. So this afternoon in the workshops, we'll actually put those up on the screen and look at some of those and see which ones you might want to tackle as we talk about open educational resources. So just to give you an example of um, not only is the price high, but the problem is actually getting worse, and here's why. So this is a, a very popular physics textbook in the United States, very nice. Um, there are many ways to acquire textbooks these days. You can buy them in the traditional way and then try to sell them back or keep them. Uh, you can rent them, you can buy used copies, there's all sorts of models. Buying new for this textbook is a bit expensive. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it's $240. Uh, but there's a rental option that's $104. Well, $104 is a lot better than $240, so you might say this is great. But what I want you to look at is, is this. It's good for 180 days. So in the same way that you would lease a car, and at the end of your lease you have to give the car back, in this case you're leasing the textbook. And after the end of the semester, or the end of the quarter, you have to give the book back. And so it's a bit like this. Everybody's seen this movie, right? And what's that thing? Uh, what is that called? Denuralizing. The flashy thing. I was talking, yes, I was talking a few weeks ago. Somebody's like, this is a flashy thing. And what does the de denuralizer do? It erases your memory, right? So, so if you're a student and you have a, you have a math book, you've got pre-calc, and you've got the book for 180 days, and next, next semester I'm going into calculus, is it possible that I might want to look back at my pre-calculus materials? I would think so, right? Or if I'm a biology major and I've taken biology 102 and I'm now going into 103, might I want to look back at my 102 materials? Certainly, I mean, that's a logical thing. As educated people, we build these things called libraries that we can actually go back and, and see resources. But the new model from the textbook publishers isn't going to allow that. The new model says you pay uh, only you can see it. You cannot resell it to anybody else. Um, you don't, in fact, you don't own anything. All you own is a short-term license to access the resource. As educators, that should scare the hell out of us, to be totally frank. We should be very upset that we are moving into a world where our students and we as faculty don't have permanent access to digital resources that are used for education. So this is what's coming. Other problems with the textbook market uh, are this. First, are that there are very few publishers left, which means there's very little competition. And with low competition, you get high prices because there's no competition. Um, they control nearly 90% of the market, and this is the real problem. And I mean, there's no, no offense at all to professors. This is just how the marketplace works. This is actually a fairly unique market. I can't think of another uh, free market that works like this on the planet. Drugs. Drugs? <laughs> no, no, even with, even with drugs, I can choose where I get my drugs from. Oh, I mean, I oh yeah, okay, yes. <laughs> I don't really buy drugs. <laughs> Although it says something about me in my mind to illicit drugs, and he was talking about the pharmaceuticals. 
That's Friday, right? But good point. Drugs are the other. Gotta get myself back on track. Too much fun. So you all know how this works. The professors choose the textbooks that are to be used in the course. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That makes sense. Faculty are the content experts. You are the domain area experts. You should be designing with instructional designers in your research librarians and others on campus what goes into your course. Of course you should do that. What's, what's, what's weird about this marketplace is that the consumer, the students who actually pay for the books, have no choice in, their, in what they're buying. Right? And because of that, in many cases, uh, professors, and it used to be that publishers really worked hard not to tell professors how much the textbooks cost. They didn't want you to have that information. That changed with the last HEO, HEOA reauthorization in the US Congress, and so now they're legally bound to tell you something like several months in advance, and then your bookstores have to publish that information. So that's all a step forward. But nevertheless, the faculty that assign the textbooks don't have to pay for the textbooks. And because of that market dynamic, sometimes things get assigned that may have a higher price point or may, uh, may not be used to the maximum extent. Uh, and then the students have to make decisions about whether they buy it or not, and then the students spend money to go back to the, back to the publisher. So, okay, that's the way it works. What are the effects of that? Here's what the research says. So first, two-thirds of your students are not buying required textbooks for your classes because of costs. Anybody have that experience? Where students just said, I, I can't afford it, or I think it's a rip-off, I'm tired of spending that much money. Um, a lot of, I, I used to work in the community colleges in Washington State for four years, and I had students all the time telling me, look, I've got, I got two choices. I can either replace the alternator in my car so that I can get to my two jobs and take my kids to daycare, or I can buy Statistics 101. But I can't do both. And so I'm going to go with fixing my car so I can get my kids to school. So this is one challenge. Another one is 50% of students say that the cost of the textbooks impacted how many and which classes they took. So to the extent you're talking about metrics like completion and reduced time to degree, this is a big one. So students are actually taking fewer classes. <clears throat> and another similar step is it's actually negatively affecting uh, what choices they make in terms of what careers they want to go into. So there's a whole lot of research that says that a lot of students say, I really wanted to be an engineer or I really wanted to be a pre-med student, but I can't afford the textbooks for, for organic chemistry, and therefore I guess I can't be a nurse, or I guess I can't be a mechanical engineer. I really wanted to do that, but the textbooks are too expensive. Another stat is that uh, almost all students, um, and if you look at, this is like uh, uh, strongly agree, if you add in the I agree, it's, it's almost 50%. Students say, look, I would have done a lot better in the course if the textbook were free. And the main reason to be, this is quite simple, the main reason they say this when you probe is that because two thirds of them are not buying the textbooks, it's very difficult to do well or succeed in the class if you don't have the resources that the faculty have designed for you to be successful. So with high textbook costs, which is what we live with today, what we get are decreased student access, increased dropout rates, uh, and decrease student success in learning. Now, when you switch to free textbooks, you get the opposite of these three things. And so I, I sum it up by asking faculty this, you know, how are two thirds of your sp students supposed to learn with materials that they either can't afford, or even when they can't afford it, they're not buying? And as faculty, and I used to be faculty, we should be outraged with this. Right? This is not okay. This is especially not okay. Because today, in this country alone, students spend roughly eight to nine billion dollars a year buying textbooks. Okay, so it's not, it's not for lack of money. There's plenty of money being spent on textbooks. Uh, the problem is, is that we're spending the money in the wrong places. And that eight to nine billion dollars, you know where that money comes from? If I want to guess, it's a third, a third, a third. Student loans and debt and cash out of pocket and parental contributions is one third. What are the other two thirds? What is it? 
Taxes, yes, you're right. And one third is state taxes that go through state financial aid for most of it community college students. And the other third for federal taxes is Pell Grants and subsidized staff with loans and, and other instruments that the government uses to help students afford college. You're absolutely right. So two thirds of that money, we're paying for it as taxpayers. And that's, those are the results we're getting for an $8 billion a year investment. So I would su suggest that that's probably not a very good return on investment for $8 billion. I think we can do better and here's why. So first, uh, backing up a step, there, we live in a world now that has a particular set of tools that we didn't have uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, and the set of tools are things that we all know. Uh, they are the internet, um, the ability to uh, purchase computing devices at relatively low costs. So I don't know if you saw, but yesterday Amazon uh, is now selling tablets in five packs for $41 a piece, like iPad type things, for 41 bucks. So buy a five pack, give them away to your family. Um, 15 years ago, this technology didn't even exist. Uh, these, these are all wireless. You can read ebooks on them. You're good to them. Uh, so if the cost of computers has dropped. Uh, you all have supercomputers in your pocket, right, with your phones. Um, and uh, the end, uh, we've got the internet, so we can move information around the world at near speed of light for near zero cost. Uh, and disk space, the ability to store things because of cloud computing. Uh, so things like Amazon's cloud and other clouds, it's become so inexpensive to store massive amounts of information uh, that we, uh, we can do interesting things. I'll talk about the licensing benefit. So because of those, uh, because of the internet, cheap computing, a lot of disk space, this is how much it costs to copy a textbook these days. Um, you can still do it by hand. Uh, I mean, that's a find a monastery, I guess. Somebody will do it for you. Um, print on demand is not bad. You can print a 300-page textbook for roughly five bucks. If you do a print run of uh, anything over 100, you can get the cost down quite low. But the one that we're really interested in is this cost by computer. So how many students do you have here at the college? 26,000. 26,000? So somebody whip out their phone and multiply 26,000 by 0. .00084. Shout out the number we have. Here's how much it costs to distribute digital things over the web now. Right? So sure, you can mail it. That's not too bad, but it's still a little expensive. But I can distribute that 250-page textbook, and it costs that. So it's, the costs are not zero. $22. OK, so if we have $22, if anybody has $22 in our pocket, we can buy every student at this community college uh, a Stats 101 textbook today. These are the economies of scale that we're talking about when you're dealing with digital things. Distribution looks like this, it's slightly cheaper. So the question for us as educators is when copying, distribution, and storage becomes free, as it has, what do we do with those capabilities? Do we just stay with the status quo and spending $8 billion a year and having two thirds of our students not have access to the resources that you've designed for your classes, knowing that they're taking fewer classes, they're not doing as well, student success is down, college is not as affordable. We can keep doing that if we want to, or we can try to use these new tools to think in new ways. So open educational resources, what are we talking about? Well, really we're talking about anything that you use in the process of education. So everything from slides to quizzes and exams, readings, videos, textbooks, Anything you use in the course of helping people learn. <coughs> and by open educational resources, we specifically mean free and unfettered access. So free means free, no cost. Right? Yeah. Here it is, it doesn't cost you anything. Unfettered, we mean I'm not going to make you jump through a bunch of hoops and logins and passwords and you don't have to give me your credit card number or any of that garbage. It's just here's the file. Right? Gonna, here's a nice, simple download. And then free copyright permissions to engage in what we call the 5R activities. And so open and free are different things. Free means no cost. Open means no cost plus the legal permissions to do this. And now this is really important. So remember the new textbook model with the flashy thingy with the deneuralizer where I'm going to take your pre-calc book away from you in 180 days? 
Open Educational Resources says, no, you can retain it. So I'm going to give you a copy of this Stats 101 textbook, and you can keep it forever. You never have to give it back. You can keep a printed copy, you can keep a digital copy. Nobody's ever going to take it away from you. The second one is reuse. You can use it exactly as it is. You don't have to ask anybody's permission. No lawyers are involved. There's no licensing fee. There's no cost. You can just use it. So here it is. Revise, you have to have the legal rights to modify it. So faculty in the audience, if I told you, so anybody here teach physics? Biology? Biology, okay. So if I told the biologist sitting over here, um, hey, you know, MIT uh, actually gives away all 2,100 of their courses, including all their biology courses, uh, as open educational resources, and you can download it tomorrow and use it, and just use it exactly as it is, these faculty are gonna say, I don't think so. Like, I don't take anybody else's content and use it exactly as it is. I might find a few things I like, uh, and I might take those parts, or I might, you know, want to revise it or remix it. So they have to be able to revise and remix. Revise is they're going to adapt it, modify it, make it better, maybe modify the level because community college students might be at a different level for biology than MIT students are. Uh, and they might want to remix. They might want to take some of their work, some from MIT, uh, the chemistry department at, uh, where was it, uh, UC Davis just went open with Creative Commons licenses. They might want to remix some of that in. Um, so you have to be able to do that, and you have to be able to redistribute it. So when they've updated their biology courses, they have to be able to say, hey world, here it is on the website, take it, it's yours. We're educators, education's all about sharing, and we're going to share it with other people too. <laughs> These are things that are restricted by copyright law in every country on the planet. Okay, so if you do these things, if I make a copy and keep it, and it's all right to serve copyright, I don't have the legal rights to do so, I will be sued and I will lose on Tuesday. And I also can't uh, reuse without permission, revise, remix, or redistribute. Okay, these are all things that are protected by copyright law. Nothing wrong with copyright law, but with open educational resources, we have to be able to do those things. So I mentioned that we've got these technical tools. We've got cheap computing, internet, and uh, the ability to store things at very, very low cost. That's all good, but if that's all you have, what you end up with is Napster. Everybody remember Napster? Right? And students were sharing music, and it was all rights reserved, copyrighted music, but it was really easy to share digital music, and so you know we had a lot of illegal music sharing going on. Uh, is that okay? Well, probably not, right? You don't want to break the law, and certainly don't want to encourage our students or anybody else to break the law. And so along comes Creative Commons. It starts in 2001. This is where I work. We're a global nonprofit. Uh, we operate everywhere around the world. And Creative Commons came into existence because of these new technical tools, but there wasn't an equivalent legal tool which was free and simple to use so that the educators, the artists, museums, libraries, photographers, musicians, uh, data scientists, governments who wanted to share all this digital stuff they had on the internet, but they wanted to keep their copyright and share under a license without getting a bunch of lawyers involved. There was no way to do that. So my own story is I was at Ohio State, I was a professor, I was teaching courses, I had all my curriculum was digital, some of it was online, some of it was in class. As an educator, I was happy to share, not only with others at Ohio State, but with anybody in the world that wanted to use it. I had a web page and I wanted to stick the stuff up on the page. But at the bottom of the web page, it said, all rights reserved, copyright, Ohio State University. And it was the footer in all of our web pages. And so when I put my stuff up and I said, hey, it's free, please take it, I had enabled the technical side of it. But everybody who was interested in it would email me and say, hey, okay, well, we can't touch that with a 10-foot pole. It's got all rights reserved, copyright on it, and Ohio State could sue us if we take your content and revise or remix or retain or redistribute. So nobody would use it. And so I, I said, well, I don't know what to do. And they said, well, you have to give us a license to use it. So I marched over to the, to the uh, lawyer's office at Ohio State, and they said, get out of here, son, you're bothering us. Right? We don't have time for this. Because there was no way they were going to write custom licenses to everybody in the world that wanted to use my stuff. It was too big of an ask, and it was highly inefficient. Along comes Creative Commons, which says, look, some things are all rights reserved copyright. After, anybody know, not Heather, she knows the answer to this. Anybody know how long it takes for works to get from copyright 
into the public domain? 25 years, I wish. 75 years is closer. What has to happen before the 70 years even start? Mickey Mouse has to die? No. I have to die first, actually. So my, my copyrighted works that I create, first, Cable Green has to die, which is unfortunate. I kind of wanted to share while I was living uh, so we could enjoy sharing together. But first, I have to die. And then the clock starts ticking and 70 years go by. And then my works go into public. And when copyright law started, I mean, the founding fathers of this country wrote into the U.S. Constitution, the term was 14 years. 14. And then if you wanted to renew your copyright, you had to just fill out a one-page uh, submission, and only about, uh, it was about uh, 14 to 20 percent of copyright holders actually renewed for a second 14 years. But then the term was 28 years total, went into the public domain. The idea of copyright is I'm going to give the government, the people, are giving you, the creator, a short-term monopoly to make money and recoup your costs and do whatever you want to do. Uh, and in exchange for giving you that short-term monopoly, you will share back with the public your creativity in the public domain. That was the idea, the core idea of copyright. Of course, copyright, somebody shouted Mickey Mouse, that was spot on. Copyright, because of uh, big companies like Disney, has been extended and extended. In fact, there are secret negotiations happening right now for the Trans-Pacific Partnership talks to extend it again another 20 years, so it'll be life plus 90. So we'll see how that shakes out. Creative Commons said, look, we'll, we'll, we'll try to fight that. We'll try to you know, reduce the term of copyright, but you're probably banging your head on a brick wall. And so what else can we do? And what we did was we said, there's gotta be something in between. We have to let people keep their copyright keep their ownership of things, and share under the terms and conditions that they choose. And so Creative Commons licenses, and by the way, this is all free. This doesn't cost anything. We're a nonprofit. We just build these licenses because we want to make it easy and legal and simple for people to share. So I'm not selling anything here. I want to be very clear. <laughs> it's all free. Um, there are four choices. In fact, the first one is not a choice. Attribution is on all of our licenses. If you if you put a Creative Commons license on your work, everybody else on the planet has to cite you. They have to give you credit. So they have to say, this was created by Cable Green, this is the title of his work, here's the link to his work, and this is the license that he put his work under. If they don't do that, they're in violation of the license and they are in violation of copyright law of the country in which they exist. So people give attribution because the Creative Commons licenses are backed by the full force of copyright law. The other three are choices. Share like means if you take my thing, let's say I built an intro to psych textbook, take my textbook and you modify it, you change it, you have to share your modification, your derivative work, under the same terms that I licensed my work on. So that's Wikipedia. Everything on Wikipedia is under an attribution share like license. So when you sign up for an account to edit articles on Wikipedia, you actually have to agree, and when you sign up, that everything you produce will be under a buy essay license. Buy is attribution. Non-commercial says, you can use my work for free, you can remix it, you can modify it, but you may not make primary commercial use of my work. You may not sell it. So MIT has the attribution share like non-commercial license on their curriculum. What they're saying, can you change it, you've got to share, and we don't want to see our stuff up on the web for 20 months. No derivative says, you can use my work for free, can't change it. So in education, we tend to stay away from the no derivative licenses because the biology department's very unlikely to take somebody else's stuff and use it exactly as it is. Biology folks want to modify it, change it, take pieces, change the word, etc. So if you mix and match those different conditions, what do you what you get are one of six different open copyright licenses. These are called the Creative Commons licenses. And when we're talking about open educational resources, when you line them up and you look at which licenses are most free, and by free here I mean freedom, how many degrees of freedom, how much flexibility am I giving to the public, am I giving to other people, uh, the most free is actually just to put your work into the public domain. Right? So we have a tool called CC0 where you can actually relinquish, give up your copyright if you want to. Most, most educators don't. Most educators want to keep their copyright, put a license on it. That's great. 
Uh, but some people say, look, I don't even want copyright on this. I just, I don't, and I don't want to die and wait 70 years either. I want to put it in the public domain right now. And we can, we, and how are you do that? Most people, though, in education choose a license. And what I want to point out is that these licenses, where the green arrow is, are OER compatible licenses. And, oh, I think I lost my mic. That's all right. There's, there's a wired one on the chair. There's a I, wired one on the chair. Yeah. Okay. And then you need me to be on the mic for the video, right? Probably, yeah, would be good. Okay. So there check, check, check. Ah, we're back in business. All right. I got a nice one for you. Uh, so, any of these licenses are okay because whether or not they're OER, the, the big question is, do you have 5R legal permissions? So can I retain, revise, remix, redistribute? Can I do all that? You can with those licenses. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's still a lot of choices. Like, which one do you recommend? Well, for example, when I was talking with your president a few minutes ago, and we were talking about the innovations money, I actually recommended to her, and I will send her an email later, uh, recommending the CC BY license. That's the Creative Commons Attribution License. So why would why do people, most people in the education community uh, like that one? The main reason is, is that it's a, it's a um, you're not putting too many restrictions on other people, and those licenses can be remixed with the most types of other licensed works out there. So with a Creative Commons Attribution License, they have to give you credit. They can kind of do anything else they want. A lot of educators say, well, what about you know, share alike? That's a great license to it. A lot of educators use the buy and say license. If it's really important to you that others are sharing forward the modifications they make to your work, then that's a great license. That's why Wikipedia went that way. Uh, Non-commercial. A lot of people go with non-commercial if they're really afraid that uh, you know Pearson is going to swoop in and grab your thing you built and sell it. And I get that fear. I can tell you, it doesn't happen. Um, I've been in this business a long time, and we've only seen it happen one time. And it was with uh, a set of resources at the University of Colorado Boulder called FET. Anybody seen FET before? P-H-E-T, so all, everybody who does STEM in the room, you'll love FET. These are simulations, we'll dive into these in the workshops. And uh, the simulations, it sims on math and biology and chemistry and it's really great stuff. It's all CC BY license. And Pearson actually looked at them and said, those are better than the simulations we have. Pearson threw away its own sims and used FET. Um, initially did not give FET any money, just you know, put them in the books. Now, after some conversation, Pearson actually writes a check to the University of Colorado Boulder every year. They don't have to legally, but they do it to be good community members. And they also do it because when they give FET money, FET builds more simulations, which is good for Pearson's books as they sell them. So there's a nice virtuous cycle there. Um, so uh, my, the, other, the other caution with the NC licenses is that non-commercial can be confusing to other educators. So as I was describing NC to you, you might think to yourself, oh, we charge tuition at our community college, and that's money, and that's a commercial activity, therefore I guess we can't use other people's non-commercial works in our classes. That would be a logical thought. It's actually not true. You can use other people's NC works. What you cannot do is sell the content. And you can even, your bookstore, could even take MIT curriculum that has the this license on it, and they could print it and sell it, sell the printed copies in the bookstore, as long as they weren't making a profit. Right? So, and a lot of faculty don't know that either. And so the reason I share that that little bit is that NC can cause confusion out there in in the education world. And if your goal of sharing your resources is to maximize the use. My recommendation to you is to be as close to the top of this list as you're willing to be. I will also say a lot of people say, oh, I don't know, I'm still like pretty comfortable down here. <laughs> uh, a lot of people start down here and they'll move up over time because you can always relicense your works. As the copyright holder, you can choose what license your work is under and you can always change it later. So is anybody using these things? Well, yeah. And in fact, these numbers are outdated. We're, we're closing in on one billion licensed works right now in the world. Uh, and a lot of this is actually educational. Uh, who's doing it? Well, this is what the breakdown looks like as of the end of 2014. 
Uh, Africa is up and coming big time right now. Uh, the Middle East is actually has a major push on, uh, and the uh, governments in the Middle East are, are backing that. So lots and lots of sharing happening. Uh, Europe is coming on even stronger. The European Union has put uh, hundreds of millions of euros into supporting faculty across Europe uh, for to develop open educational resources. Uh, and you know, everybody's everybody's growing. So this is all good. Let's bring it back home, though. Uh, as I said, I used to work in the, the Washington community colleges. Uh, and we asked questions like this. Uh, what's our highest enrolled course? Uh, and in Washington community colleges, it's English Composition One. It's a basic writing course that everybody takes. That's how many enrollments they have across the half million students in 34 colleges every year. The average cost of that textbook is 128 bucks. And so just our students in Washington State, on one book, for one class, for one state, small population state, right? For one system, only the community colleges. This does not include the seven universities in the state. We're spending eight million a year. And it's a third, a third, a third, right? A third out of students' pockets and debt. Third state money comes right out of the state general fund. And a third is, uh, is federal money. And so uh, you all, as federal taxpayers, pay for a partial chunk of that. And so a lot of people look at this and they get a bit disgusted, right? That's a lot of money, especially when two thirds of our students were not even buying the book. So it's a third of our students for generating that kind, uh, those kinds of numbers. So we said that's not okay. And what we built was something called the Open Course Library. And the Open Course Library, which is, there's the URL, if you can kind of turn your head, opencourselibrary.org. This is essentially the entire general education curriculum for community colleges under a Creative Commons attribution license. Everything we built, we put under a CC BY license. But what you'll find is that we didn't build, we probably built 20 to 30% of these courses. Most of what we did is we remixed other people's stuff. Right? So we went to MIT, our physics and biology professors. They downloaded all the MIT courses and threw away most of it. But they kept 10 or 15% of it. Right? And they went to the University of Barcelona. It was all in Spanish, they translated. But it was really good content. We took maybe 5% of that. Right? We took stuff from all over the world where people were willing to share. And we remixed it into what was appropriate for community college students in Washington State. Took stuff from Brazil, translated it, threw out all the examples of the Amazonian rainforest, put in Northwest examples that made more sense to our students. Okay, the highest enrolled 82 courses in Washington State Community Colleges are now online. You can go to that website, you can download them today. There's no login or password. It's all up in Google Docs. We made it really simple. Anything we built is under a CC BY license. Anything we took from somebody else, we gave proper attribution. We listed their name, the title, a link to their work, and whatever license they chose. I would say we, we spent about a million five building that. All that money went to faculty and librarians, instructional designers. There were people from our colleges, and we gave them release time. Some people took stipends and did uh, over overage work. I can't remember what they call it. Uh, but most took release time, the third release time. And instead of teaching three classes or four classes, they taught one less. And they did some of this work. Uh, it has already saved students, I think they're up to north of $9 million in textbook costs. And that's only from the hundred or so faculty that built these and adopted their own courses. So part of the deal was if you're going to build this, you have to eat your own dog food. So if I'm on the physics team and I'm writing physics courses, I need to use what I'm building, which you know makes sense. <laughs> and nobody objected to that. So those numbers are just from the faculty that built and adopted their own stuff. We actually don't have very good numbers because of course with open educational resources, you can just go get stuff. So one of the challenges is it's hard to track the metrics on who's using what. We're working on that at Creative Commons right now. We're actually working on using blockchain technology for you techies in the room to, to, be, to make it possible for the person who's sharing to see who's using their stuff and where it's being used and if it's been modified, et cetera. So we're working on that right now. Anybody heard of OpenStax College before? Okay, well, if you don't look at anything else that I said today, go check this website out. This is Rice University. Uh, the project is called OpenStax. Uh, you may have heard of Connections. It's a big OER repository they've been running for about 15 years, uh, which is now called OpenStax Connections. But these guys basically said, look, this is crazy. Everything Cable's talked about so far, we've got to do something about that. And so their, their phase one goal is to build the highest enrolled 25 courses 
uh, textbooks that we all teach. So if you look at the list, it's intro to stats, intro to SOCH, intro to biology, concepts in biology, which is biology for non-majors, stats, anatomy and physiology, econ, macro and micro, intro to chemistry, US history. These are courses that everybody teaches, every community college, every university. Every one of these books is free. Every one of these books is under a Creative Commons attribution license. You can download them, modify them. Uh, they're, they save students already since launch with just a few books. They have like five to seven books up. They've already saved students across the US $30 million. The projections are next year alone, they're gonna save another $25 billion for students. You could do this tomorrow. So for faculty who are inter interested in this, go to OpenStax, find if there's a course that you teach here and look at, at downloading. There are other really interesting projects um, and a couple of things I want to emphasize that I was talking with uh, your president about before. Bottom line on all this is not the content, right? What we should be always thinking about is how does this affect the student? How does this affect student success? How does it affect student affordability? How does it affect student completion? And also, how does this affect faculty? Because community college faculty in particular don't have a lot of excess time, let's be honest, right? Uh, they need time, they need support, and so a couple of these projects I'm going to show are really about putting faculty at the center of this conversation as well. So at University of Minnesota, uh, when we started talking about this, the faculty said, hey, this all sounds great, but I don't have time to redesign my class, and how, how do I know which open textbooks are any good? Uh, you know, I don't trust Cable. Cable doesn't teach calculus. I trust other calculus professors at the University of Minnesota and other calc professors around the world. That's who I want uh, to know what they think about these five uh, open source calculus textbooks. And so these guys set up a project where faculty review, if you just go to University of Minnesota, type in open textbooks in Google, it'll pop right up. Um, and they put together a bit of faculty professional development. They put together a session where it's two hours, faculty come in, and they're now doing this all across the United States. And it's called the Open Textbooks Network. If you guys want to join, it's free to join. And, and they're uh, providing professional development for their members. Um, but after a two hour session, 35% of the faculty that came into that session walked out adopting an open textbook. That's amazing, right? And it's just the way they present the data. And they're very compelling, much more than I am. Uh, and then what they found was that if they gave faculty just $250 to review an open textbook, in addition to taking that two-hour professional development, they got up to 60% adoption. So it's, it's actually quite doable for relatively low amounts of money and support for the faculty. It's all about helping the faculty do what the faculty want to do anyway. Another story, which is this kind of hot off the press, uh, University of Maryland, University College, I was there a couple of years ago, and we were talking about all this, and they said, we want to do something big. I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? And they said, we just want to do all of it. I said, what does that mean? I said, you know, all of it, like all of our curriculum, let's just go textbook zero on everything. And we said, okay. So, they, um, so their whole undergrad curriculum is now OER. Actually, that's not true. It's a mix of uh, free but not open content. So free, all rights are copyright content on the web, but you, you don't have legal rights to do, so the fact they can't modify it or change it or rebroadcast it. So there's some limitations there, but it is free, and students like that. They work with their library, and they leverage uh, resources that the library has licensed uh, that may also be all rights reserved copyrights. They can't change it, but you certainly can use it, and that's also uh, you know, paid for by the university. But most of what they did was open educational resources. Uh, and they lost support for the faculty, course design teams to help the faculty. They just moved 60,000 students to OER. And the next thing they're going to do is move their 15 to 20,000 graduate program, uh, student graduate programs to OER as well. Um, here's one that's a community college example that everybody's talking about these days. This is called Tidewater Community College in Virginia. These folks took a online business administration degree. The old textbook number for this degree program was about $3,700. So it's a, you know, it a whole degree program, but the textbooks cost roughly $3,700. At the end of it, the textbooks cost zero. Now, several interesting things happened. Some of it we knew would happen. Course completion rates went up, 
time to degree went down, students were uh, actually doing better in the class, so student success was going up. Why? Well, it was obvious, right? 100% of the students on day one had 100% of the resources. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. I just told you two thirds of your students uh, in your classes are not buying the books that you've assigned, so you know that's gonna hurt them when they come into your class. Imagine a world where 100% of your students not only have the resources on day one, but they actually have them a month or two or three months before they even come to the class. And when they sign up for your class, there's an automatic email that goes out from your registrar's office that says, hey, well, excited that you're gonna be in Psych 101. By the way, here's all of your textbooks and everything. If you wanna get started early, you can. Anybody teach developmental math or dev English in here? Okay. So developmental math, you got students coming in your class, there's, there's a great project with amazing statistics on dev math. Students already are not good at math, which is why they're in developmental math, right? They're in a community college, which means on average, they're gonna be lower SES, which means they don't have a lot of money. So they're probably dependent on financial aid to buy their books for developmental math. Now, I don't know about your financial aid department, but a lot of schools that I go to, the students get their financial aid checks sometimes in week two or week three of the semester or quarter, and then they can go and buy their dev math books in the bookstore. And now I'm bad at math already, now I'm three weeks behind. I had to make a choice about whether I was gonna spend the money of my financial aid check on dev math or resources or not. And we wonder why students get stuck in the developmental math cycle, right? So there's, there have been big projects around dev math where everything moved to OER, and guess what? Student success shot through the roof. In the Kaleidoscope project, which was a big uh, Gates-funded project, uh, the, I think they went up 35% in student success in deaf math. 35% more people were completing deaf math and not repeating it than before they moved to OER. So these are, these are radical changes. These guys also had an interest, interesting stat that nobody had ever thought of before. So uh, Madam President, I want you to perk up your ears on this one. The community college made more money and continues to make more money in tuition when they move a course to OER. Anybody know why? More students are signing up, that is true, because they advertise this and say, hey, this is it. They call them Z degrees. So this is a zero textbook cost degree, and students go, zero textbook costs, right on, like, I'll go into business administration. So that is true, but that's, that's not the main reason. What's the main reason that a university or the college make more money? What? Retention. Kind of, but it's not quite retention. That's also true, and you're both right, that does <laughs> what he's but that's not what I'm fishing for. What I'm fishing for is lower dropout rates in the, in the ad drop period. So during the ad drop period, it's usually what, six to eight weeks or whatever it is at your college. What is it here, six weeks? Week what? Week one, oh, they only get one week, okay. So in one week, so your students walk into their classes here, One week with a refund. Seven, Seven weeks with a refund. Okay, but I'm talking about with a refund. So one week with a, So your students here walk into their class and they've got one week to essentially decide, do I think, A, I can handle the load I've got, and B, can I, am I gonna be successful in this class? And if I've made a decision not to buy the textbook for the class, for whatever reason, then that goes into the calculus in my head and I might think, I don't think I can be successful so I'm gonna drop the class so I get my refund back. What they found is when they moved to OER, 14% more students made the decision to stay in the class than when they didn't have OER. 14% more tuition meant more money. The administration looked at that and said, that's a pretty good deal. We like this additional revenue flow. And so what they are doing what the provost office is doing with the president is they're taking most of that increased revenue and they're driving it back into faculty support so that they can get more OER because when they get OER, they get more tuition money and they've got this virtuous cycle going. And eventually they want to get to where UMUC is where every degree program at their community college is textbook zero. And by the way, students, and I'll get to this later, the students who take these courses, because it's not just the degree program, this degree program has intro to stats and other general ed courses. When the students take one of the Z degree courses and they're marked with a Z in the course catalog, so 
the students have a choice of five intro to stats courses, and one of them is a Z degree course. Which one are the students signing up for? That one, right? And they walk into their next course, and the, the course has a $150 textbook. Are the students happy? No. Right, so the students are starting to exert some pressure on faculty in a very positive way and saying, you know, hey, can I had this course, can I help you find some open educational resources for your class? Some good news in, some good news in Oregon, uh, not only did you all just pass a bill that said free community college tuition, which is awesome, so you're following on Tennessee's heels and the president has called for this, but you also passed this, and I don't know if you know this or not, but you passed House Bill 2871. The only reason I know this is I went and testified on this and worked with your legislature a bit. And they put out $700,000 to do two things. They're going to hire a full time OER coordinator for the state for higher education uh, at the HEC, the Higher Education, what does it stand for? Coordinating Commission. Coordinating Commission, thank you. So there's a new, there'll be a new OER position at the HEC. And after that position is paid for out of 700000 I'm estimating here that's going to cost them 150 with salary and benefits, something like that. There's going to be the rest of it available for grants for you all for these types of activities. This is what the bill says. So you want help to find OER? There's grants for that. You want help to uh, properly attribute, use other people's OER? So you want to redesign your course with other people's stuff and not build anything? There's money for that. You want to create new stuff because you can't find what you need? Fine, here's a grant for that. And uh, faculty, assist faculty members as they seek to use OER in their courses. That was really general. So basically, if you want to do anything with OER, Oregon has a new grant program uh, to the tune of north of a half million bucks that you can tap. Not everybody knows about this. You now have an edge, go get the money. <laughs> you also have something called Open Oregon. Uh, this is really great. If you don't know Amy Hoffer, you should get Amy to come and talk here. Amy's fabulous. She's a librarian. All librarians are fabulous. Uh, librarians tend to be at the heart. They are. They just make them more, right? And librarians get OER. Librarians say, you know, if you told a librarian you're going to walk in and take half their collections and throw it away tomorrow, they would kill you. Uh, but that's what the publishers are doing now with textbooks. And so the librarians don't like that. Librarians like to have access to resources in perpetuity. Right? Librarians understand free access for the public. That's the whole point of libraries. And so they get who we are. Well, so or Open Oregon is this great resource, mostly a coordinating body. They also have a little bit of grant money that they're giving out to community colleges. And they're all about sharing. In fact, on their website, it says everything we do is under a Creative Commons attribution law. You've also got one of the leading companies in OER in Portland. So it's just down the street, it's called Lumen Learning. Um, these guys are, uh, they are a for-profit company, but their whole mission essentially is to help US community colleges move to OER. Now I don't usually promote anybody. The only reason I promote these guys is that everything that they build with any community college, they require in their contract that what's built goes under a Creative Commons attribution license. That's really great, right? So even if you never hire them to do anything for your community college, everybody else in the country that's hired them to build degree programs, uh, they're building Z degree programs all over the country right now, including in my state, in Washington. They're building new online competency degree programs right now. All of it will be under a CC BY license. You can just sit there and cherry pick that stuff all day and just take it, right? It's all free, and you can take it and revise it, remix it, do whatever you want. You never have to hire them. If you find, the only reason I bring them up is if you decide you really want to go big in OER, you want to, your biology team says, hey, we're like, we're sold, but we need some help. We need help finding this stuff, we need help with instructional design, we need help putting it together, the president gets excited. You know, I can't stay here for two weeks to work with your biology team. That's what these guys are for. Okay, so I just, one of the reasons I pointed out is they're here in Oregon. And then of course you have Heather, who's awesome. And Heather's whole team, and you've got, and Heather's put together this really amazing website. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, please take a look at it. Um, and it's, Heather will tell you where it is, but I just found it by typing in OER at MHCC. She's got lots of great resources on here, and she's tapped into what's happening globally in the OER community, and she's bringing a lot of those resources here. So it's a nice one-stop shop for all of you. So uh, I shared these stats. I, I thought I'd do this here. I was at a college affordability summit with the US Department of Education 
um, and others talking about the president's call for uh, free community college. And I got called in to say, yeah, free tuition is good, but let's also have free everything else. All the content should be free and open. And because if you have those two things, now we're talking for students, right? Let's not take two thirds out of the cost of college. Let's take 100% out of the cost of college. And so these numbers, I hope, uh, offend and upset you and get you a little angry. And so the numbers are this. If the students in the United States, just public education, community colleges and universities in the United States, if they were assigned just one open textbook each year, so of all the courses these students take, if one of their textbooks was an open free textbook, uh, we would be saving these kinds of money. So there are 11.1 full-time undergraduates in the state. If one textbook was assigned, this country would save $1.4 billion a year. Okay? Full-time and part-time together, is about 17.7 .7 million, that's 2.6. And let's just look at intro to psych, right? One subject, one class, there are 1.5 million students in the United States taking intro to psych right now. If just intro to psych was assigned, it would save students $191 million a year. Okay, so these are big numbers. These are, and especially with the, uh, with the students that we have, who a lot of times don't have a lot of them. Okay, this is why I'm in OER, is because I worked in community college. If I would have stayed in universities, my guess is I would have taken a different career path. They're less price sensitive. I got sick and tired of sitting down with students in focus groups and having students telling me they were making academic decisions about their career and their family and their life about the cost of textbooks, and it made me angry. And when we get angry, we have to do something about it. Uh, so this is all, these are all words so far. Um, a lot of people might, in the audience might be saying, how can I trust you? <laughs> What's the research? So here's the research. Uh, there have been so far to date, and it, this is about to be 12, but uh, 11 peer-reviewed studies with this many students, so we've got a pretty big N, where we're looking at student success. So these are pre and post. When you take a course that was OER, by student success, we're looking at the learning outcomes that have been defined by the faculty in the course syllabus, and whether or not the students are hitting those at the end of the course. So. 93% same or better outcomes. Now by same, you might be saying, well, same, so is that no significant difference? In some cases, yes, it is no significant difference. But you've taken the cost of the textbook from 100 bucks, 200 bucks to zero, or your students are getting through, they're graduating sooner, student success is uh, either staying the same or getting better. Here are studies looking at the perceptions of OER quality. So this is whether or not faculty and students think it's any good. Smaller end, but still highly significant. And this is what faculty and students say. About you know, half of it, they say, yeah, it's, you know, it's fine. Like, it's the same. But 35% are saying better, only 15% worse. So these are the types of questions you should be asking here. Right? You, I was being briefed in advance. I understand you're in a bit of an enrollment crisis. Right? You're looking for more students. Your president talked about retention, completion, student success, et cetera. Okay, I showed you studies and a lot of data that retention goes up, student success goes up, uh, increased tuition because of fewer dropouts. Right? Uh, I can tell you UMUC is changing its billboards as you come out of Washington, D.C. Today they say, come to UMUC because we've got online learning flexible for your life. Right? Flexible to meet the needs that you have in your life. The new billboards are going to say, don't go anywhere else, come to UMUC, no textbook costs. That's their new advertising to recruit students. Um, I think they're going to be very successful as they move forward. Quick note here, we talked about higher ed. I want to get you a little bit more angry about K-12. Uh, your numbers are actually worse than these because these are Washington uh, state numbers, my, and you're bigger than we are. Uh, my state spends 100, and I get uh, especially, uh, I have fun with these numbers. I have two young boys who are 10 and 7 years old. And as you can imagine, I'm all sorts of fun at PTA meetings. <laughs> so for our $130 million a year, here's what we get. Our books are 7 to 10 years out of date. So my kids, my fifth grade son's books are a decade old. Uh, I'm not very pleased that the knowledge that's being put in front of them is, is 10 years out of date. I don't think that's what we should be doing in an education system. Um, it's only paper, so he's lucky enough to have a Kindle at home, we have an iPad in the house, we have a laptop. 
not, very little of what he has is, is digital. It's, it's in paper. Uh, because it's paper, he's not allowed to write in the books. Why? You've got to keep the damn things for a decade. Uh, so the, the next, you know, you can't mark out these books. So I had all the study skills he's learned in his library classes about, yeah, you should take notes as you go along, you should highlight things. Sorry, can't do it in your learning resources. Uh, it's all rights reserved copyright. So when I sit down with his teachers and I say, so how do you feel about your content being 10 years out of date? Teachers, one of the teachers actually started crying last year. And she said, I'm so upset that there's nothing I can do about it because it's all rights reserved copyright and I don't have the legal rights to update it. If I did, I'd be violating the law. So I have to teach around this decade old book. And this one, uh, <laughs> I get especially take that. Um, we have a lot of um, migrant families that come through Washington State to pick apples, to pick strawberries, uh, and they come through uh, Central and South America. And as they're coming through during the crop seasons, their children come into the public school system. Uh, and that's great. Brings diversity, brings, uh, brings a new perspective, brings new languages. Um, I think great for, for my sons as well. Um, most public schools, and I imagine you do this in Oregon as well, say if the, parent, if the kids lose the books, the parents have to pay to replace the books because you gotta keep them for 10 years. They're expensive. The books cost on average $120 for a K-12 textbook. So you have to sign something as a parent that says if my kid loses the book, I agree to pay $120 per book. The migrant families don't have that kind of discretionary income. In fact, a lot of our friends that we play soccer, my kids play soccer with, don't have that kind of discretionary income. And so parents are actually telling their students, their, their sons and daughters, don't take your educational resources home with you because little kids lose stuff. My kid came home the other day missing a shoe. <laughs> so how'd you do that? I don't know, Dad. They, they lose stuff, and they're going to lose their, they're gonna lose their textbooks. And so, for 130 million dollars a year, we got parents telling their kids, "Please go make friends with people who are wealthy enough to take their textbooks home, and go play with those kids so that you can study math at night." This is the education system that we've built. And it doesn't have to be this one. Right? I've sat down with our legislature and I said, give me $100 million one time, and we'll build open educational resources for all 12 grades, all subjects. Give me a quarter of that money, give me 200, uh, or give me $25 million a year. We'll keep all that content updated, state of the art, with faculty from around the country who are experts in those fields. We'll make it all free, to, not just to Washington State, but we'll give it to Oregon, Louisiana, New York, anybody who wants it. They can modify it if they want. And we'll give it to all the kids in print, because we can print all this stuff for four bucks a book up at Amazon. And we'll give it to them in five digital formats. Now everything's up to date. Nobody has to sign anything. Kids can keep it forever. They don't have to give their books back at the end of the year. Right? And you're not spending $130 million a year. Now you're going to spend $25 million a year with much better results. Five minutes. This is what we could do. Uh, so we got sufficiently upset about all that that we started something new called the K-12 OER Collaborative, which I'm proud to say uh, Oregon is in as well. And so we're saying no more. What we're doing now is we already have $4 million uh, pulled together. We're going to build uh, ultimately all subjects, all grades for K-12 under a CC BY license, and we're going to give it away for free. And we're going to continuously update it. And further, and this is even more important, the goal here is not to have free openly licensed content, although that's important. Our main goal here is to change the culture of what it means around teaching and learning in K-12. What I mean by that is we want, we want teachers and we want particularly high school students to be engaged in continuous updating of curriculum and sharing of knowledge and for students' assignments to actually be, so imagine walking into 10th grade and you're going to learn geometry or trigonometry. And your teacher says to you, uh, Cable, for the first half of the course, you're going to learn trig. Second half of the course, you're going to improve the course. So imagine walking into a biology class and your biology professor saying, first half, you're going to learn about biology. And the second half, you're actually going to do research on the new biology research which is coming to the fold, and you're going to update the course and, and bring it up to speed. As a student, that's a much more authentic task than giving me an assignment at the end of the assignment I throw it away, you throw the last thing I want to talk about, and I, uh, I hit, hit up your president on this as well, is the idea of open licensing policy. 
or more to the point, publicly funded resources ought to be openly licensed resources. When the public pays for something, the public should have access to what they pay for. So what I ask your president to do, if I'm not out of here, uh, is that when she gives out uh, discretionary funds, like from the foundation, that there's a Creative Commons attribution license requirement on those optional discretionary funds. So it's not forcing anybody to do anything. It's just if you want this optional grant that you agree to share whatever it is that you build. So that, that very simple idea has taken hold all over the place. So first, the President of the United States a couple years ago said, if you take a research grant from the any agency in the US government, you will share it freely 12 months after publication. So librarians will recognize this is what research looks like today. And grants go up, research gets done, articles get submitted, authors have to turn the copyright off. So when you're faculty at Oregon State University to research, they actually have to give up their intellectual property to the journal. They have to sign their rights over. Articles get published in closed journals. Heather's got a limited budget. She can't afford to sell or these other journals that cost fifteen or twenty thousand dollars a year. Even though Heather was a taxpayer that funded the research, your students here don't get to access that journal because it costs fifteen grand a year. So sorry, can't access that now. Libraries subscribe or not, the public's granted no reuse rights. And what do you get? Well, you get slow scientific progress because nobody can read the research. New model looks exactly the same, it's just that up front here, the funder says, if you take this money, you have to freely and openly share the resource under an open license. You don't like those terms? That's fine. You don't have to apply for the grant. You want to do cancer research? You're going to share your results with anybody in the world that wants to learn about cancer. That's how we're going to cure cancer, by the way, is if everybody gets their eyes on it. Closer to home, um, you may have already heard about this. Department of Labor and Department of Ed put out $2 billion a few years ago for U.S. community colleges to build new academic programs where there are jobs. Okay, Oregon has gotten, I don't know, 40, 60 million of this money. Um, the requirement, Creative Commons attribution license on everything that's built or revised with the $2 billion. You don't like those terms? Don't take the $20 million grant. Guess how many community colleges turned down $20 million grants? <laughs> Zero. They all took it, and guess what? They're all sharing. Is that a good thing? Yeah. The old model is that Louisiana got $20 million, they built a nursing program, and they thumbed their nose at Oregon and said, can't have our program. Okay? Oregon helped pay for it, but you can't have it. New model is everybody gets everything. Does it cost any more money? No. Same amount of money. Right? So they would have given out $2 billion anyway. It's just that now they're giving out $2 billion, and they're saying, if you take the money, you got to share is that a better return on investment for taxpayers? For the government? You bet it is. Right? Uh, I just worked with the, uh, the community colleges, the chancellor's office in California. They've adopted the same policy. Any, they move about $120 million a year through their optional discretionary grant funds to faculty for all sorts of different projects around student success and building curriculum, et cetera. Everything must be under a CC BY license. We did the same thing in Washington State. Uh, years ago, we said, if you take money from the state board, CC BY on what you build. Uh, and then I'm proud to say this institution, your president, actually signed a letter that we sent recently with 100 signatories on it from around this country uh, to the president of the United States saying uh, publicly funded education resources should be openly licensed under a CC BY license. The, the public should have access to what the public paid for. You know how much money the government moves in discretionary grants? annually, tens of billions of dollars, well more than $100 billion. It's, it's, it's approximately $60 billion a year just in academic research. And then you add, add resources on top of that. Lots of projects on top of that, and we won't go into it now. Final slides here. Faculty, these are my asks of you. Before you assign your next textbook, take a look at this stuff. Take a look at open stacks. Take a look at, uh, go to BC, British Columbia open textbooks, look at their faculty reviews. Go to University of Minnesota, look at the faculty reviews, and just take a moment and see if there's anything out there that might work for you. And two, don't, don't think you have to build everything. There's literally millions of OER that are begin, being given away for free under an open license all around the world. Take a look at that. I will show you this afternoon how to find all that stuff in the workshop. And third, Please consider sharing what you create under a Creative Commons license. 
Choose the license that works best for you. We've got lots of choices. Um, but think about sharing, because education is about sharing. That's what we do. Students, here are my students over there. Here's what you should be pushing on. The faculty are not cringing as I show this. It's a, ask your faculty to take an open textbook pledge, which is nothing more than I, the faculty, promise to take a look. Not promising to adopt anything, but I will take a look at what's out there for OER before I assign my next textbook. Uh, students, you should be asking your administration to highlight OER in the course catalog. If there is a course at this institution which has an open textbook, uh, it should be marked in the course catalog so the students have that consumer information when they're making choices. A lot of institutions are moving this way. The whole Maricopa district in Phoenix just did this recently. Ask for internships to help faculty move their course to OER. Faculty need help. They don't have a lot of time. If students can say, you know, hey, can I get college credit? Uh, can, I, can I go out and do research, maybe with the library, to help faculty find resources for the course that I need to take next quarter? Maybe that can be the way the students could help out. And ask your faculty to let you co-create and improve curriculum as part of your assignments for courses. Students love that. They put that on their resume. I helped build and revise Statistics 101 when I was in college in 2016. Right? I'll put that on my resume. I can't put on my resume I took a test in Stats 101. That doesn't do me any good. Right? And then the college leadership, the administration, here are my asks of you. Look at your strategic plans to the extent you're talking about student success, reduce time to completion, increased affordability. OER slots beautifully into those. You should add phrases like, and we will consider OER as we're trying to accomplish these things. Um, put open policies on your discretionary grants. We already talked about that. Require a CC by license when you give out optional discretionary money. This is not about forcing faculty to do anything. So I'm not saying all faculty here should be forced to put CC by on their courses. That's not it at all. I'm saying you take optional money, you should share. Uh, support faculty. This is the number one thing administration can do. Give release time. Provide research librarian support. Uh, when faculty want to move this way, move heaven and earth to help them out because they are amazing and they need help. Make this a university, or in this case, college-wide discussion. So I asked Heather, do you have an OER team here? The team should have bookstore, financial aid, students, faculty, administration, somebody from the provost's office, anybody who's at the institution who cares about affordability should be in that room in this conversation. You should track and report things like cost savings and other key performance indicators that you care about. So if you start to move courses to OER, Find out what the textbooks cost now, and then what happened when you moved to OER. You should report out on that to your board, to the legislature, to other community colleges in the state. Send me an email. I'll put it on the homepage of Creative Commons. We'll generate some buzz for you. Um, and to the extent you're doing MOOCs or other you know, public online courses, put a CC license on those. So final thought for the 21st century, the opposite of open is no longer closed. The opposite of open is broken. Thank you very much.